Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 9. An hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Now let's pray. Father, bless us as we uh, study your word tonight. Give us wisdom and, and help us learn how to be, uh, help, uh, give us wisdom and give us the ability to, to improve ourselves and to be the kind of men and women we ought to be, and in particular to be good neighbors. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, verse 9 says, An hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. And I'm not going to go there, but keep in mind what Jesus calls your neighbor. Your neighbor is anybody who lives nearby or that you come across, uh, because we're all, we all come from one blood, so anybody you come across in life. Um, uh, the, 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 the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, the Good Samaritan didn't actually know that man that was laying in the road uh, who had been beaten and robbed and left for dead by robbers. But because he came across him, that made him his neighbor. Because he was nearby. And so, uh, so I'm going to talk about being a good neighbor a little bit tonight. The Bible says, An hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. So how does a man destroy his neighbor with his mouth? Well, number one, by being a hypocrite. So what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is somebody, there, there's two ways to be a hypocrite. Most people think a hypocrite is someone who, who talks one way and lives another way. In other words, uh, he's not what he claims to be. Uh, for example, a person can talk about being honest and having the integrity in lying and stealing and being a crook uh, and covering it up and hiding that. So that would make him a hic hypocrite. But I'll tell you, there's another kind of hypocrite, too. And that's the kind that talks bad and is evil, but inside, somewhere along the line, they got saved. But they're ashamed. They know they're not living right, so they just live wickedly. They're being a hypocrite, too, because they're actually a child of God just backslidden and covering it up and ashamed that they don't represent Christ well, so they live like the world, and they're a hypocrite, too, because they're not of the world. See, and not much preaching is done about that kind of hypocrisy, but that's hypocrisy too. And that's why I believe what this is talking about, and a hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, a guy who will not talk about Jesus because he's ashamed that he can't represent him well, but he knows Christ, he's born again, he's a child of God, but he lives like a child of the devil, he's being a hypocrite too. Because he wants to fit in with the worldly crowd, he talks like the world, cusses like the world, and talks about worldly things, he's destroying his neighbor because he's not being what he ought to be. He's not being a testimony. Look, you don't have, all a person has to do who's not, who, who is saved, born again, and, uh, and glad of it, who feels ashamed that he doesn't live up to the standards of what a Christian ought to be, all he's got to do is, is say so. And just say, look, I'm not living like a Christian I live, but I am a child of God, and boy, I wish you'd get saved. That's not being a hypocrite. If you admit that you're not living right, see? But if you try to cover up and try to be macho and be like the world and, and talk tough and, and cuss, throw some cuss words out so you can blend into those guys, you're being a hypocrite, see? And you're destroying your neighbor. You know, well, I don't, want, I don't want, I want them to get a bad impression of Christianity. When the news comes out, because eventually it will, that you actually were a Christian all that time, oh boy, that's going to do more damage than, than you. So, so when we rationalize and become a hypocrite in any way, it's not right. So how do we keep from becoming a hypocrite? Just be honest. <laughs> Just be honest. See, Just, uh, if, if you can't live up to something, say so. See, if you're on the job and you tell your job, your boss says, hey, I need someone to do that. Do you know how to do that? Oh, yeah. And you don't? Well, how do you keep from being a hypocrite? Learn real fast. I remember Brother Hiles one time, he, uh, he didn't want to do a certain thing. And he learned that if he could work in the office and learn how to type, he could get out of KP or kitchen duty or so. I don't know what. But I, I forget. It's, it's a long time, so don't hold me to this, anybody that hears this. If, it, if this ever gets out. Don't hold me to this. I'm just best I can remember. But anyway, so, so opportunity came. They needed someone who could type. So he said he could type. He didn't know how to type. 
He says, I can because I can means I'm going to <laughs> in his mind so I can learn. Um, so anyway, so, so they said, all right, here's a, here's, a, here, here's, a, here's a typewriter and get to feeling at home at it and we'll give you some stuff after a while. So he remembered uh, someone who took typing that one of the sense they learned to type and practice with was, now is the time for every good man to come to the aid of his country. So he started typing that. Now is the time for every good man to come to the aid of his country. And, uh, and uh, so, in the, so he, had, he had practiced that over and over and over. And then he'd look at a book and try to type some other stuff, but he'd be real slow. But he learned how to type real fast. Now is the time for every good man is to come to the aid of his country. He got that down real good. So when his commanding officer come by, you know, checking on his typing, and he's struggling, he'd just start typing. Now's a good typer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> typing real fast. And he covered up and covered up and covered until he got better at the other stuff. He learned how to type that way. And uh, so, uh, now, it reminds me of so many other illustrations he gave where you just use your head and find a way. Uh, he said a lot of times he'd be flying on airplanes when he'd, he used to travel a lot. And I love the story. He'd travel out and he'd be sitting next to somebody, some university professor or sometimes some scientist or someone who's an expert in some field. And so, you know, he'd introduce himself. And when he find out this guy's like really smart in some area, he'd start asking questions about it. And he learned how to ask questions to where when you ask quite a certain way, you sound like you know what you're talking about. And so the guy who's an expert thinks you're pretty smart. So he learned to do that. But the, because the guy is answering his questions, he's learning as the guy's responding. And then when he gives, tells, teaches something, he says, he'll use, he's had some common sense. So he puts common sense together, this new information he's learning. So he'd ask a question about that, goes in more detail. So the guy would go in more detail. So he learns level two that way. I mean, he just learned how to think and learn, learn how to ask questions to where these really smart people thought he was pretty smart. And then after he thought that he had them pretty well um, uh, impressed with him, then he had introduced himself. That he is, a, you know. Th then he said, "Oh, by the way, I'm a pastor. I didn't. I know I didn't tell you that. And I know you don't expect pastors to know this kind of stuff, but, but you know, I, I study a lot. <laughs> Meaning, I study people, which he just did. <laughs> that guy didn't know he was he was a te he was a, a, what do you call it? Um, a, 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 a book, a, a learn, a book of learning from Brother Hiles. But anyway, so all that. To, and by the way, I learned that. So when I go soul winning, I do the same thing. When I go soul winning, I talk to people and, about things in their yard. I'll ask them about the trees, and I don't know what a tree is, but I'll ask them. You know, that looks like a certain tree, and I'll name some tree that I do know. And then, uh, so they think I know something about trees, and then I'll ask them, now, what's that one? I can't, I, I can't, I can't think of it because I don't know it. <laughs> But, uh, but anyway, and so they tell me, and I say, oh, yeah, that's right. Why? It is right. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming they, they weren't lying to me. But anyway, so you, you do things like that to, to become winsome, to get people to, 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 to respect you to what they will listen to what you have to say. Now, that's wisdom, and that's, that's, um, it seems hypocritical, but you're not going to destroy your neighbor because you're learning, and you're, you may start off, I don't know anything, but... I've learned this, and after hearing those stories, I think they're funny stories, but I don't really want to be that way. I want to just be honest and tell people, you know, I don't know much about that. Would you teach me? See, why? Because I guarantee you, I'll guarantee you, there's people who will say, after hearing the story I just told, I mean, that preacher lied to all those people? Maybe he didn't lie, but he certainly you know, tried to impress them when there was nothing to impress them with. <laughs> now, so that, that's called worldly wisdom. But godly wisdom is what I want to share with you today. Don't be a hypocrite. If you don't know something, say you don't know something. By the way, if we're honest about something that we don't know, guess what? That person that knows something is going to feel smart. Isn't that a good tool, too? Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? I'm not telling this to criticize Brother House. I love Brother House. And, uh, but I'm not going to copy, and, and I have done that, but I don't want to. At some point years ago, I said, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, so I try not to. But I try to uh, tell people, you know, I don't know much about this, but uh, what, what is that? Or can you explain that to me or whatever? So honesty and integrity 
is, is the thing that we all should strive for in all areas of our life. You know, and let, let me explain something. Sometimes, here's, here's how personalities get corrupted. And sometimes, uh, and hit, Hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but you can also destroy yourself. Let me give you an example. Here's a person who doesn't, who has a fault, something they know they're lacking. So what do they do? They cover it up. And so what happens is they get used to covering up. Now, if you cover up one thing, guess what? You're going to find out, wow, I succeeded that. And guess what? You're going to start covering up something else. Pretty soon you're going to cover up something else. And you're going to learn and get good at covering stuff up. And pretty soon, you're going to be nothing but a cover. <laughs> you see where that leads? Do you understand? Now, so the best thing is don't be a hypocrite. If you don't know something, admit you don't know something. If you know something and that you ought to be doing something, you're not doing it, admit. You know, How many times do you hear me admit from the pulpit? I don't do everything I ought to do. And I'm not all that I ought to be. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not as good a preacher as I should be. I'm not as good a Christian as I should be. Why? Because I don't want to be a hypocrite because I'll destroy people with my mouth. Because, okay, like Paul said. He said, uh, well, I wish I knew the reference, but I can quote it. He said, I bring my body under, or I keep my body under and bring it into subjection, lest at any time when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So, Paul is saying there, I can keep my body under control, under submission, my tongue, my body, so that I do what's right. Lest, if I don't, then I'm going to get out of control, and I'm going to say things I ought not say, say things not true, act in ways that are just, it's fake. See? Um, and what's going to happen is when I preach to other people, okay, if I walk in and say, and put on this fake air. Boy, things are great. Boy, what a great day. Praise the Lord. Hey, let's just praise the Lord today. If I came in here and acted like that. By the way, that's what you see a lot on television. That's what you see in a lot of preachers, these big mega church pastors. They have to be on top side when they come out. So therefore, they put on an act. They got to be all happy. They got to have a big old smile on their face because frowns don't draw people. See? Now, so what happens? They get used to doing that so much that they cover up. And their private life is terrible. So, uh, sometimes, you know, I want to stay on top side, and most of the time I am. But there will be times when you'll notice I'm tired, maybe a little bit down, discouraged, whatever. Now, if you ever see that, don't just make a note, preacher's tired today. Help me out. <laughs> Give me some encouragement. <laughs> Pray for me, okay? And I'll do the same for you, best I can. That's what we ought to do. Look, how can we exhort one another to help each other if we don't know each other's down and in need? If we're all a bunch of hypocrites and act like everything's fine, no one's going to help anybody. Then what's the point of fellowship? And then when we testify about how good, God, how good God's been, and someone knows that, we're going through some tough times. And actually, they're going to think, what a hypocrite. And pretty soon, there's going to be a lack of respect. So the best way for God's people to have good fellowship is to everybody to be honest. Just be honest. Have integrity. Don't be a hypocrite. Because hypocrites with their mouth, by the things they say, to cover up, put on, act on, put on a show, act a certain way, and... Put on airs and so forth, however you want to word it, it will destroy your neighbor. Because someday someone's going to say, Oh, I thought he was a really good Christian. Now I find out. Or, I didn't know he did something. He always preaches against that. Now he's doing it. Well, then I'm going to do it. See? So, uh, so we've got to be real careful. Let's be honest. Let's, let's say, Hey, we're, I'm just trying to live like, live like God wants me to, but I fail a lot. You don't have to go into the details. Just, let's just be honest with each other. Let's not be hypocrites. Jesus, read Matthew chapter 23. Jesus railed on the Pharisees. He called them hypocrites. Called them blind guides. Called them serpents. Vipers. 
and all kinds of names. Why? Because they were hypocrites. So, all right. And the hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. But through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Notice this, the con, see, destruction and deliverance are the, are the um, opposing situations. Somebody is going to be destroyed because someone's being a hypocrite and using their mouth as a hypocrite. But someone's going to be delivered because someone's using knowledge, what they know is right because God says it. And that's why we need to use the knowledge that we have. Use the knowledge that we get from the Word of God. The Word of God is true. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of Kings is He. The Lord of Lords supreme throughout eternity. So let's talk about truth. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Let's talk about the Word of God. Let's talk about truths of God. Let's talk about biblical doctrines. And, uh, and let's talk about God's goodness. Let's talk about His grace. Let's talk about His mercy. And then, if we talk about God all the time, we don't have to talk about ourselves so much except in our relationship to God. And the benefits we received, and the mercy we received, and the grace we received, and the blessings we received, and the thanksgiving that we have in our hearts. And along the road, we're going we're gonna, to, why would we, why, how can we praise the Lord for mercy if we don't experience it? How can we experience it without messing up and sinning? So you see, that's how we stay honest. Praise the Lord. That's why there's a whole chapter of the Bible that ends, for his mercy endureth forever. David didn't put on airs, hey, I'm the great psalmist of Israel. I'm the king. I'm a great Christian. I'm a man after God's word. No, David never said that. Paul said, or Stephen said that in Acts chapter 7, or, or Paul somewhere. Paul, I guess, uh, later on in Acts. He said that about David. David didn't say, I'm, you know, I'm the apple of his eye. So, let's, let's, uh, let's be honest, people of integrity. Verse 10, When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. And when the wicked perish, there is shouting. And probably shouting for joy, okay? Now, not necessarily by those who know the Lord real well, because God is not pleased. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, the Bible says. So, people who really know God... Um, are not going to rejoice when the wicked perish. But the average person who suffers under the oppression of wicked people, yeah, they're going to rejoice. Let the crowds rejoice. See, if something were to happen to Obama and he died, I'm not going to rejoice. I will thank God that his judgments are right, but I'm not going to rejoice. Best, I'm going to do my best not to. But I tell you, a lot of people will. Because the Bible says they will. That's a fact of life. doesn't mean that's the way it should be. That's just what's going to happen. When the wicked perish, the, um, there is rejoicing. There is shouting. See? It doesn't say that sh there should be. It just says that's the way it'll be. Why? The average person doesn't have good sense and doesn't have a heart for God and doesn't realize that, that a wicked person just went to hell. The average person isn't going to think about that. They're going to think about, good, no more injustice. Good, no more tyranny. Good, no more oppression. Hey, all right, hey, all right, let's celebrate. So-and-so died. See, that's what's going to be, but that doesn't mean it's right. Okay? All right, now let's go back to the first part. When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of people rejoicing when Kent Hovind gets home. See. All over America, lots of region. Oh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people. Oh, man, uh, he's out. Well, yeah, it doesn't say the wicked people are going to rejoice. It just says the city. Now, there's the average, when it says the city, or later on, and the, the second part where it says there is shouting, is talk about the general populace, the general people who know a little bit of what's going on. They know that someone's a good man or a bad man. And it's talking about the average person's response to when it goes well for the righteous or when the wicked perish. So the average people are going to respond with rejoicing and shouting. Uh, either way. Now, verse 11. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. All right, so a city, keep in mind, in, in the Bible days, a lot of times cities were individual. You had walls around them. You had the king of a city. 
you know, uh, there's the king of Sodom, there's the king of Gomorrah, there's the king of, uh, of, 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 of Bashan, and, and so forth. There's, uh, there's all kinds of cities, they had their own kings, okay? Now, so, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. In other words, an upright leader of a city, or the, if, if the majority of the people in a city are upright, then God's going to bless that city. And so, by the blessing that comes from God, a city is exalted. Wow, boy, you ought to, that city, is, you know, people are going to brag about it. They're going to exalt, they're going to praise and laud that city. Wow, that's a good city. That's one of the best cities to live in. Such a good king, and the people are so friendly, they're so kind, they're generous, they're, they care, genuinely care about you. Why? When God blesses a people because of their uprightness, they're going to treat each other right. And, and blessings of God are going to come. Peace is going to come. And there's going to be more trust among the people. They're going to care for each other's needs. And they're going to be in, genuinely interested in other people's needs instead of being suspicious. So, now what are you knocking my door for? What you want? <laughs> you know? So, so the blessing, by the blessing up, of the upright, a city is exalted. People think a city is really great because of the upright, the influence of the upright and the blessing of God that comes from that. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. A wicked person can use his mouth in such a way to bring destruction to a city and cause the city to be overthrown. Why? How? Well, easy. All you got to have is one wicked person in a city to go and tell somebody who wants to take over that city the secrets, how to get in at night how to do this. All you need is one person to betray a group of people. And a wicked can overthrow a city with his mouth. See, the mouth and the tongue, very powerful weapons. See, that's why we get the phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword. A pen is just putting in words on paper what the mouth would say. So, so that goes along with that principle. All right. Verse, um, verse 12. By the blessing, let's see, verse 12. He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor. Oh, by the way, since I talked about being a good neighbor, you want to make sure that you don't give away secrets about your neighbor or your neighbors or your city, your town, whatever, or your country. So you don't want to be a spy for somebody else. Why? You're not being a good neighbor. Because somebody's going to come in and use that knowledge and destroy. You want to be careful what you tell about a friend to somebody else who's not necessarily a friend. Because that person might take that information and cause a lot of problems for your friend. And then you're destroying, you're, you're, you're helping to overtake, someone to overtake your friend. See? So that's why lawyers, for example, have, uh, they have the protection of confidentiality. Whatever you tell a lawyer or a doctor or a pastor in counseling, you should be able to rely on that. You should be able to know that they're not going to say that anywhere else and spread it. There's a responsibility there because those people who are told things in confidence can destroy a person's reputation. See? All right, so... Uh, be a good neighbor and be careful how you use your tongue. Be careful what you say about your neighbor because you can destroy somebody with your tongue, with your mouth. What's well, the old saying? Loose lips, loose lips sink ships. See? Loose lips. Man, you put a zipper on that mouth if you have to. Just because you know something that's good and might make you feel good, might make you feel like you're somebody. If it's told you in confidence, you keep it in confidence. See? Okay. Uh, verse. Let's finish verse 12. He that's, uh, he that's void of wisdom despised that his neighbor. Oh yeah, I went back to. Uh, so I never finished. Uh, really covered verse 12. He that is void of wisdom despised that his neighbor. Boy, that's such a simple statement um, that people stumble over it. But it makes sense. He that is void of wisdom despises his neighbor. What's so bad about despising your neighbor? All right. If you need help, who's the best person to help you? Easiest, most convenient. Your neighbor. That's right. 
So if you respect your neighbor, then you are securing, helping to secure yourself or provide yourself with help if you ever need it. So he that despises his neighbor isn't very smart, doesn't have wisdom. See? So use wisdom and gain respect. Make friends with your neighbors. Get their respect. Do something kind for them. Treat them honorably. Treat them as if they're somebody and, 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 and act like you like them until you learn to like them. No, don't be a hypocrite. Learn to like. Find something to like in your neighbor. Find something to respect. Again, it goes to this thing, what do you look at? We tend to, I haven't done this a long time and I can't do it now, but if I had a big old uh, whiteboard, I don't want to do it, but, but uh, I'll pretend this is an ink spot. If I were to take a pen and mark an ink spot, I said, what do you see on this screen? What are you going to say? You're going to see, oh, there's a spot over there represented by this, okay? Now, so you're not going to say, oh, I see a whole lot of white. But that's the majority, isn't it? Yeah. You're going to let the minority grab your attention. See? And so when you look at your neighbors, you need to learn to do the same thing. Look, don't look at the spots, the things that are wrong. Look at, he's a human being. When I was watching the video of, of, of and, and there's just the one picture of Ken Hovind there and his family, I was thinking, wow, isn't that amazing? That's an image of a man. It's just an image. It's just reflection. It's just light showing colors on a screen. But it represents somebody who has a brain, who has a heart, who loves God, has learned so much, and has used his faculties, his tongue, his mind, his eyes to read things and his ears to hear things and learn things and teach and preach and spread good things. What a great man that image represents. And I was thinking, I wanted to interrupt, but I didn't want to. I, was, I wanted to say, what a great man that is. But no, that isn't a great man. He's not there. <laughs> he's on his way to Florida, if he's not already there. He's a real living being. And so a lot of times we get caught up in imagery and what we think and the reputation of somebody instead of getting to know them get to know your neighbors he's got flesh he's got a heart that hurts he's got a body that might have some disease some sickness some ailment some pain some weakness he's just as real as you are get to know your neighbor and respect your neighbor don't look for the fault say well I don't want to be friends with him because of one thing or even two or three, or even five or ten. Remember the song, Count Your Blessings? We need to count, count the positive traits in our neighbors. Count them up. Don't bother counting the negatives. They'll kind of stick out anyway. You can't help. So don't bother counting them, but count the good things. And that will help you to be a good neighbor. Alright, so... That will help you to respect your neighbor too. So he that is void of wisdom despises his neighbor. But a man of understanding holdeth his peace. What does it mean, hold your peace? Generally, basically, it means you don't speak up. See? Um, hold your peace. Um, so if you, in other words, if you speak up because you see something wrong with your neighbor... You're going to bring it to the surface. You're going to cause unnecessary problems. You might end up destroying your neighbor and destroying any potential relationship you have. So he that is void of wisdom, these go together. He that is void of wisdom despises his neighbor, but to the opposite, a man of understanding who's going to see things in his neighbor he doesn't like, but he's a man of understanding. He's going to understand, well, I've got faults too. So I'm going to expect him to have faults. And I'm not going to judge him negatively because otherwise I could judge myself. I've got to quit hanging around myself. <laughs> How are you going to do that? How can you not be a hypocrite when you hang around yourself but you won't hang around somebody because of one or two faults? You see what I'm saying? So a man of understanding is going to hold his peace. He's going to say, you know what? I don't need to talk about my neighbor. I don't need to talk about his or her faults because i got my faults too. And I understand that. 
so I'm going to hold my peace. That's what we ought to do. Now, there are times, there are times when, for the sake of learning or teaching someone, but, but this needs to be someone that you have an influence on who trusts you. You can teach some things, use things that are obvious, but don't tell things that, that a person doesn't know if it's not necessary. Okay, verse 13. A tale-bearer reveals secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. I'll probably stop with this one. A tale-bearer. Now, we know what that is. We call it now tattletales because you tattle on somebody, you tell a tale. So a tale-bearer is the same thing, someone who bears news, or uh, uh, a, t- a tale is something that is told, that can be told. Something can be told. Um, so a tale bearer, someone who carries a message of something that can be told, a tale bearer who does that all the time, that's a tale that doesn't need to be told, but he likes to bear it and say, hey, guess what I heard? No, it's just a gossip. Someone who says, boy, I got something juicy for you today. That's a tale bearer, okay? A tale bearer revealeth secrets. Tale bearer hears someone say something in confidence and then goes and tells somebody else. All right? And you reveal secrets, things that should not be known. But, so a tale bearer reveals secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Now, what does that mean? All right? He that is of a faithful spirit. All right? You think the Spirit of God wants us to tell everything we know, everything we find out about everybody we know? No, the Spirit of God wants us to be just and honest okay all right so a person who has who is full of faith who has a spirit that is full of faith faith in god faith in god's ways faith in god's word when he finds about a about a secret that somebody has he's going to conceal it now let me clarify it means uh, okay, a tale bearer reveals secrets. Now, if there's, okay, if someone confesses to murdering somebody, or someone talks about how they stole from something, somebody, or they just threw a rock and blew out somebody's window, and oh, all right, now let's keep that secret between us. Does this verse apply to that? You think a person of the faithful spirit would conceal that matter? No. Because if you got if you got a faithful spirit, you have faith in God's word, and God's word is teaches that if, that if someone does someone wrong, they ought to pay for what they've done wrong. See, but if someone's there's there's a fault about somebody where they have not hurt anybody, it's just a personal flaw where they're just hurting themselves, but they've not devil, de, de, uh, they've not violated anybody's person, anybody else's property, or anybody else's rights. That's the kind of matter you conceal. It's not going to hurt anybody. If you have a faithful spirit, you will conceal that matter. Uh, but boy, if someone admits, confesses they fault, or they've done somebody wrong, someone's property or their rights, that's not just tail-bearing stuff. I mean, that's something that should be in court. I mean, when someone's rights are violated, we're supposed to protect each other's rights, respect one another's rights. So if someone violates someone's rights, that should be told. But if something's just a secret and it's not going to hurt anybody except the person who's, you know, joke of the, the Lucha kids, they'll, they'll, they never forget anything. You know, if I feel anything about me, they, they never forget it. So they still laugh and talk about the time I preached one of the first few sermons that, that they were here. I talked about how that, you know, I ate my boogers when I was a kid, you know. They love to talk about that, see. But it's no secret anymore because I became a tail bearer for myself and I told on myself. And, uh, but I did that because I know there are kids that struggle with habits like that that are gross to other people or embarrassing. And I wanted them to know, hey, you can break the habit and it doesn't matter how bad it is. Now, why did I do that? I did that, I told on myself to help some child that I knew might be struggling with or to help some adult that has a bad habit, personal habit, or, or a, maybe even a sin that they can't conquer. So I use that say, I conquered it. And I told how. 
how, what God did, the impetus, the motivation that God gave me to say, I will never do that again. To where if, my, if, I, if I'm in cold weather or whatever, get a runny nose and it runs down and gets on my lip and I lick my lips, I'll spit it out. I'll, I'll, I won't do it. Now, do I still like the taste? <laughs> how do we say? I'll have to be honest. Yeah. But I refuse. I refuse. And since I was 18, I have never swallowed on purpose. <laughs> I've always, if I get on my tongue accidentally, you know, from runny nose or whatever, I spit it out, I wipe it out, I wipe it on my sleeve, something. Why? Because I don't want to go back. See, I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to get up and say, well, folks, let's start eating my boogers again. I'm 50, <laughs> 60 years old. <laughs> I don't want to do that. You know, that'd be gross. So, anyway, now, but I want to give hope to people who are struggling with something else. You see what I'm saying? Now, so, uh, but a secret that somebody has that they would be embarrassed to be revealed, if you've got a faithful spirit, you will conceal that matter. See? Conceal that matter. It's not, if it's not a crime, if there's not violating anybody else's right, you conceal it. It's not anybody else's business. See? Um, even if you think it might be wrong for them to do that, but it doesn't hurt anybody else, you still ought to keep that a secret. It's not going to do any good. What good is it going to do? It might give somebody else an excuse to do it because they respect that person. Oh, if they do that, well, I'll do it too. And that would be bad too. So, uh, he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. All right, I'm going to stop there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for your word. Help us, Lord, to control our lips. Help us control our tongue, our mouth. And, uh, and help us be good neighbors. Help us be people of a faithful spirit. They're full of faith in your word and what you say. And, uh, and help us to protect each other, watch over each other, respect one another, respect our neighbors, be good to each other, treat each other like we want to be treated. And don't say things about each other we wouldn't want said about ourselves. And uh, so bless us with that. So we'll, and help us to be honest and not put on airs and be fakey and phony but to be down to earth and real and confess our faults one to another if it's necessary so we don't become hypocrites bless we pray through our lives because of this Bible study in Jesus name Amen